So as soon as everyone joins back from the breakout rooms, we'll be able to start. Okay, I guess everybody's back. So uh, we can start again with the um, uh, lecture by Daniel Segre. So please, Daniel, if you could uh, share the, uh, the slide. But f first, thanks to be, to be here. <laughs> and uh, uh, great, thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, should I start? Yes, yes, please. Everything. Is okay. Good. Great. Um, so, hi everyone again. Um, we're going to continue talking about dynamical modeling of communities. Um, and if you remember, um, our third part is going to be on spatial temporal modeling and long term history of metabolism. Uh, but where we stopped last time before we can actually uh, talk in detail about this, I want to remind you one of the issues that we saw arises when you start, when you try to build um, models, flux balance based models of communities based on this multi compartmental, uh, multi compartment approach, where you have different cells uh, containing different metabolites, uh, and the metabolites have just different labels based on the compartment they're in. And uh, we said that this would require um, some assumptions about the ecosystem level objective, and it have issues such as, you know, would then really allow you to predict the abundance of different species in a community, and it also cannot accommodate for predictions of, of the spatial, spatial temporal dynamics of these communities. Um, and we started showing um, this figure, which I'm going to now discuss in detail, which, as you'll see, will solve all, with all of this problem at once in a, in a way that is opens up a number of possibilities. Um, and this is something that is called dynamic flux balance analysis. It's an extension of flux balance analysis that adds back the temporal aspect of this in a way that is um, um, a little bit different than what you would see when you build a standard kinetic model. And the idea is the following. Uh, so imagine, right, remember that when you have a metabolic network with definition of the boundary conditions, uh, all you know the molecules that come come in um, and are uh, described by inequalities that tells you what is available um, and by how you know with what rate um, and you have the biomass function uh, the biomass um, reaction that defines growth of the cell and you can solve the flux balance problem which will give you a prediction of all the fluxes that allow the cell say to produce in an optimally efficient way its own biomass now, the outcome of the simulations, right, are uh, is a vector of fluxes, which include uh, the rate of uptake of each nutrient, the rate of production of biomass, and the rate of production of each of the byproducts. Now, imagine that uh, building a this dynamic flux balance modeling um, as a stepwise approximation of the growth curve. So you start from an initial amount of nutrients in the environment. So this blue curve is the environmental nutrients available. Um, and you start with a very small amount of biomass. So in your first step of a flux balance analysis, if you solve flux balance analysis under those conditions, and we'll talk in a second how you translate nutrient 
availability into a, an uptake rate, which is what you need for flux balance. But if you infer the fluxes for the nutrient uptake and the biomass production, these are essentially the slopes. We'll give you the slopes of this curve, right? We'll tell you how fast the organism, organism grows at this instant in time. And all you do is assume that this um, is that it's reasonable to extend this initial slope for a certain amount of time, an interval delta t. So you will update the new biomass after this time delta t. Uh, in a similar way, you can predict how much nutrient is being consumed by just multiplying the rate of consumption of this nutrient by uh, this interval in time. So you have a prediction of the new updated nutrient abundance. And you can keep doing this again and again. So you're, here you'll solve a flux balance problem again, and you'll end up having a new level of the consumed nutrients and the biomass increases and, and so on and so forth. And what you can also see happening here is that at some point, there may be no byproduct present at the beginning, but as the organisms grow, there is a secretion of this byproduct. So if you update the, abound, the amount of the byproduct in the environment, this will start increasing. So by doing this dynamic FBA, you will have a, a piecewise linear approximation of the growth curve in green and of the abundance of each different nutrients. For example, this initially available nutrient could be glucose and a byproduct acetate in the example of E. coli that we saw before. Um, so one, one, one thing I wanna mention right away is why is this helpful for modeling ecosystems? So this, you know, you can imagine this being useful for modeling the abundance of a certain organism in, in, a, in, a, in a given environment. So this is very similar to flux balance analysis, but it adds this uh, temporal component. But what is additionally very important about this is that um, imagine you put in the same simulation, a second organism that has a biomass, which we call biomass prime. So it's a different organism that has a similar resource allocation problem. But imagine that this second organism only grows on this pink byproduct, cannot grow on the initial nutrient. So what could happen here is that this organism that could not grow at the beginning because it didn't have its preferred substrate can now grow on this pink uh, byproduct, this new metabolite that is being secreted. Um, and this process now becomes an emergent uh, phenomenon, right? We didn't know a priori whether the second organism could grow or not. It could only grow after this byproduct is being accumulated because of the activity of the first organism. And what is most interesting here is that there is no assumption about an ecosystem level objective. Each organism is trying to maximize its own fitness, its own growth capacity. But as an outcome of this process, we can still see, as shown in this example, the emergence of cross-feeding, right? Of one organism secreting a product that another organism can use as food source. So you can see how powerful uh, this paradigm can be because it allows you to model communities and exchange and competition, right? This um, two organisms might compete for the same nutrient so the nutrient will run um, down faster without having to assume this explicitly. And this all depends on the intracellular circuits of each organism, what is each organism can and cannot do. So it's really uh, a way of observing and predicting the emergence of competition and cooperation based on exchange of metabolites straight from the organism's genomes. Now, I hinted to the fact that this is, um, requires some additional care in terms of predicting the uptake rates. And what is, in the end, nice about this, this is a, essentially a hybrid approach that uses some components of kinetics, standard kinetics, and some components of FBA for intracellular metabolism. And if you think about this, right, FBA will uh, require the fluxes, the incoming fluxes, but here we start from an initial concentration of, of the extracellular metabolites, not the flux. So how do you convert the concentration to a flux? Well, the obvious way is that you use Michaelis mentic kinetics, the classical saturation curve we mentioned before, where you can predict the uptake rate, in this case, what's gonna be the upper bound to what the cell can take in as a function of the concentration. Um, so you'll need to know the parameters that define this curve. So these are the traditional uh, Michaelis-Menten constant and the KCAT for enzyme kinetics, uh, but just for the boundary condition. So you'll need to know these kinetic parameters only for uh, the reaction of uptake of the different nutrient 
uh, from the environment. So again, there is a kinetic component in the uptake rate, but then once the molecules are inside, inside the cell, you assume that the cell is at steady state and you predict the intracellular reflexes and the growth rate as a function of um, you know, this, the standard steady state approximations. But again, with environmental condition dictated by the concentration of the metabolite rather than just, just uh, um, arbitrary bounds on the fluxes. So this allows you to monitor the change in the environments and see how the environmental uh, composition is modified by the presence of, the, of whatever microbes you have here. And this in turn can affect um, the uh, future of the community. So um, when we develop this, um, this idea of using dynamic flux balance for study microbial communities, we also wanted to in, um, embed in this the capacity to model the spatial structure of communities as well. So in addition to implementing this engine, uh, this dynamic flux balance engine in a given region in space, we added process of diffusion. Um, the initially we modeled the pressure generated by cell when they grow and divide, uh, potentially fluctuations in the environment. And um, we do this by looking at the local, local neighborhood. In the end, we do um, numerical solutions of the PDEs for describing these processes. And we end up having this um, uh, discrete simulations in time and space where each region in space represents a certain average amount of the biomass of a given organism. And we can do the simulations of say colonies growing on a Petri dish. In this case, it's just one uh, single organism, but of course you can do this for an arbitrary number of organisms. And again, model uh, the dynamics of communities in space and time, which is why we call this comets, computational microbial ecosystems in time and space. The first work presenting this was from 2014, um, but the, the platform has evolved significantly. Um, let me show you some example of how we first uh, tested this uh, platform. Um, a lot of the parameters such as the VMAX and the KM for the uptake rates were taken from the literature. Similarly, we could implement a death rate that was known from previous measurements, metabolite diffusion, biomass diffusion, and there are other parameters that are essential for the modeling, but there are a very limited number of parameters uh, relative to what you would have, again, if you had to model the whole kinetics of the cell. So there are no internal kinetic parameters. Internally, everything is uh, based on FPA, so there is no internal kinetics. Um, this is a snapshot of the simulation of um, simple organisms growing. Um, and one first test was showing that um, the rate of growth of colonies on a surface is actually known to uh, increase linearly and the growth rate uh, obtained with comets with the simulations was uh, very similar to the growth rate obtained uh, experimentally in prior, prior observation. And you can see that it strongly depends on the carbon source that is available uh, highest with glucose and lower with lactic and acetate. So this was um, uh, initial, if you wish, um, testing or calibration of the model. Um, and now the model has evolved into a much broader platform. Uh, so for those of you that are interested, um, this is what we call Comets 2, is a much enhanced version, uh, which is now available at this website, runcomets.org. And this is a collaboration uh, between our lab and the lab of Kirill Korolev at BU and the lab of Alvaro Sanchez at Yale and Will Harcom at uh, Minnesota. Um, and what is nice, this turned into it, I mean, it, it was initially and it still is an open source platform with the idea that different groups could add different modules and the hope is that people will uh, be interested in using this platform, reporting if they find anything uh, they would like to see or it's not working properly and also consider adding different modules. So the, this is written in Java and, but we have now Python and MATLAB interfaces. Um, just to give you an idea of what this can do, right? You can predict, as shown before, the colony, you know, let's say colonies growing on a on a on a surface or on a petri dish. But at any given time, you have all the variables that flux balance and dynamic flux balance analysis give you. So at any given time, you could look, for example, at the growth rate. You can see here uh, the colonies tend to grow on the sides, in the perimeter of the colony. You can look at the amount 
of the metabolites left on the plate at any given time. So for example, glucose is being depleted and acetate is being produced. These are E. coli colonies. Um, there are a number of other features. We are adding now nonlinear diffusion, uh, finite population effects. So you can see um, this dendritic structure and um, um, uh, sectoring happening um, and the nutrient dependency of coronary morphologies. Um, thanks to Alvaro's input, uh, comets now have, have the capacity to implement evolutionary processes. And uh, there are a number of other features that are being added extracellular enzyme secretion and functions and so on. So this is uh, for now available as an archive preprint. Um, and again, manual and instructions uh, should be all on the website. So um, this is uh, the platform, but let me show you a little bit more of what kinds of things we did early on and we're doing now to uh, using this approach to really try and understand community dynamics and interactions. So, when we first implemented this, we were lucky to, lucky to have um, an exciting collaboration with uh, the group of Chris Marks um, and, and uh, Will Harkov, who at the time was a, a postdoc in his group, had developed this very nice um, artificial community of two strains. One was an E. coli strain that lacks the capacity to produce methionine. So this organism cannot grow on its own unless you provide methionine in the medium. Um, and the other partner was a, sal was a salmonella strain, uh, except that the salmonella uh, could grow on acetate, but not on lactose. So um, if you were to grow this system on lactose, the, e the salmonella would not be able to grow. But as you can already see, um, because E. coli secretes acetate uh, that can feed the salmonella, and if the salmonella could produce methionine to help this E. coli, then this could be a stable um, uh, community of two obligatory syntro uh, syntrophic bacteria. Turns out, uh, in addition to engineering this strain, uh, Will had to evolve the system in order to um, uh, make sure that the salmonella could really produce the methionine to feed the E. coli, and this ended up working beautifully. So what we did, this was for us an opportunity as we wanted to test comets, we built, incorporated uh, the model uh, of E. coli, of the E. coli mutant and the model of Salmonella. And we asked uh, whether uh, the model would recapitulate the experimentally, experimentally observed proportion of the two species. So this was the experimentally observed proportion of the two species. Uh, interestingly, this was this proportion with the higher E. coli and lower Salmonella was converged to uh, irrespective of the initial conditions. So this was a stable composition reached from different initial conditions and comets recapitulated quite well uh, those proportions. Now, you could think that this is a little bit of an overkill. And in fact, you could imagine making much simpler models of this organism that would recapitulate based on the uptake and secretion of compounds, these, uh, the observations. But um, first of all, I mean, it's in this case, there is no tuning of internal parameters. Uh, the michaelis menten parameters were taken from the literature. So it's uh, still quite nice to see this agreement. And what was uh, somehow uh, then quite surprising is that this works worked also for a three species community. And this is again, um, experimental work done in the Marx lab. Um, in this case, in addition to these two organisms, uh, they added a third bacterium uh, called Methylobacterium extorquens. This is a bacterium that typically grow on plants. So it's interesting that this community is really a synthetic community that is composed of organisms that do not come from the same biome. These are just have different origins, but you can make them coexist. And in this case, the way methylobacterium was added to the system is by providing methylamine as the only nitrogen source. And of course, each of these organisms will need nitrogen. So if they don't have ammonia in the medium, um, they will need to get the uh, nitrogen from the methylobacterium which can uh, produce ammonia and in fact feed these two. So this three species community now is, an, is a community where each of the species need the other two. None of the individual organisms and none of the pair can grow on its own, but the three, three species can grow together. Uh, and again, um, there was uh, the experimentally observed proportion of the three species after a number of passages. And this was recapitulated 
reasonably well by the comets uh, simulations. Now, what is also interesting here, by the way, is that uh, in a somehow counterintuitive way, um, methylobacterium, who is the slowest organism, organ, uh, slowest growing organism, was the most abundant in the population. Um, and this was because probably was not it was producing the uh, needed nitrogen at smaller amounts. So the only balance that the community was was would found would find was with a higher abundance of the, of that organism. So this was promising, and this was really the first indication that comets might be a valuable um, resource for modeling uh, uh, ecosystem level metabolism. Um, and and you know more about this later, but let me uh, show you first um, uh, some example of how one can use the spatial aspects of comets to also address questions about the spatial structure of community and interactions in, uh, in, um, on a plate. Um, oh, be before actually going there, one thing I wanna highlight uh, that is actually important is that, you know, remember we talked that some of these secretions are spontaneous secretion. So for example, the acetate produced by E. coli that fits the salmonella is uh, this natural production that E. coli uh, will have um, to maximize its own growth rate. So this is a you know, one of the kind of the, the costless uh, secretions we discussed last time. Um, but this other um, secretion, the secretion of methionine is really something that was an evolved trait. So it's somehow uh, imposed, even if it's a costly trait, it's imposed by the um, necessary interaction between these two organisms when co-evolved on plates. Um, in, in, in our uh, simulations, we had to impose this methionine secretion flux because uh, flux balance model could not naturally um, take into account the mutation that uh, the salmonella strain had to overproduce methionine uh, in this case. So this is something that is um, kind of uh, material for, for future uh, research, how to really, and whether it's possible to take into account uh, these evolutionary mutations that could uh, produce, uh, give rise to the production of costly metabolite. There is a very nice paper by a former postdoc in the lab, um, which I'm not gonna discuss here in detail, but looks uh, exactly at how this costly secretion in dynamic FBA or FBA uh, can be combined with game theory to address questions about stability of uh, microbial communities connected by uh, leakage of metabolites. But um, let me go back to, as I was saying earlier, the spatial structure of these communities. There is one simple experiment that uh, Will did uh, with the two strains, the Salmonella and the E. coli, just growing them at different distances. And as one might expect, because uh, they depend on, depend on these diffusible molecules, the closer together, uh, the better they can help each other and therefore the uh, better they grow, faster they grow. Um, and this is recapitulated also in the comets experiments. But this was somehow uh, quite trivial, uh, but we'll have the idea of, of testing a slightly more complicated scenario. Um, and the idea was the following. So uh, imagine you put, Two, these two colonies on a dish. You have an E. coli strain, our um, methionine knockout strain, and our salmonella, the evolved salmonella strain on a plate. Um, so as shown before, they will grow, diffuse, probably acetate and methionine. There may be other metabolites involved, but likely these two would be key and be able to grow. But now the question is, what happens if you put a second salmonella strain in between these two? Um, and the expectation we had, and one of the reasons we modeled this, is that we expected what we called uh, kind of an eclipse effect. So we expected that somehow this salmonella strain would take a lot of the nutrients, the acetate secreted by E. coli, and leave this um, initial salmonella a little bit in the shadow um, without, and, and not allow it to grow as efficiently, or maybe at all, as it did before. So this was somehow the expectation. We wanted to model this metabolic eclipse on a Petri dish. Um, and we actually did the modeling first. And what we found uh, was quite surprising. That is, what we saw is that the, uh, this salmonella, and this is showing the uh, uh, growth of um, 
the distal, we call the distal salmonella, so this uh, colony, in presence and in absence of this uh, intermediate colony. And what we saw from the model predictions that was that this salmonella could grow faster in the presence of this um, eclipsing um, intermediate colony. And this was somehow puzzling. We weren't sure whether this was an artifact of the model, uh, but when we uh, Will did the experiment, he confirmed that this is also happening experimentally. That is this uh, salmonella strain in the middle of the plate, we ended up helping this distal colony rather than harming, harming it. Um, and as you can probably imagine, the reason for this is that even if the salmonella is really potentially using some of the acetate in, uh, that the E. coli is secreting, of course, diffusion goes around. And it turns out that what happens is that this salmonella uh, is closer to the E. coli, so it will help this E. coli grow more efficiently, produce more acetate. And the net effect on this distal colony is that um, the, uh, uh, the growth rate of this colony is increased and, and helped by the extra acetate produced by E. coli more than it is hurt, uh, reduced by the um, eclipse effect of the intermediate colony. So somehow, um, sorry, somehow the, the idea is that um, this uh, in intermediate colony, um, which seemed originally or in our minds was, uh, was going to be a competitor of, of this one ends up helping because it helps uh, its partner. So um, this is. Sorry, yes. sorry. Yes. Just, just, just to clarify very quickly, that intermediate one can also excrete methionine, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, yes. And we thank you for the question. And we, uh, we did do the control with uh, non uh, secreting. Uh, salmonella, and in that case, uh, you do observe really this eclipsing uh, effect. Um, thanks for the question. So, you know, one could obviously explore different geometries. There are some nice follow up studies to this. Um, but I think the main take home message uh, from this example, and for me, was kind of quite revealing is right, we tend to often think of interactions as being positive or negative. Uh, but when you look at them in, in the spatial context, uh, things can get quite more, quite more complicated. Uh, and I think that's something that is important to, to keep in mind and take into account when you look at uh, community in uh, spatial settings. Um, one thing I want to show you, one can look because of the, um, because of the um, capability of comets, you can look at any given time at different aspects of the simulations. For example, again, these are the three colonies. You can look at the intensity of the uh, acetate secretion flux. And as expected, you can see the E. coli uh, in blue is secreting acetate, whereas, whereas the two salmonella strains are using up the acetate. And you can see that this changes as the colony grows. And most interestingly, uh, recapitulating what we discussed early on, uh, at some point at the periphery, uh, of the colony, right? The E. coli, it's still secreting acetate, but the internal component of the colony where probably the uh, lactose, which is the main carbon source here, is running out. These E. coli cells starts to take up the acetate again that they secrete before and grow on that acetate. So there is this uh, phenotypic change that happens, happens within a colony. There are independent confirmation of this happening to uh, in E. coli, but it's interesting that uh, this happens also in this case. And again, it shows you uh, the, the potential insight that one can get by looking at these different layers of the metabolites in uh, comet simulations. Um, okay, I don't know why there is. Uh, okay. um, so, there is um, um, a few things that uh, comets and its uh, different applications can help with. Um, one thing we started doing, and this is um, feasible through a network visualization software called Vizant, developed uh, by Jun Hu and Charles Delisi, 
uh, we combine this with our comet simulations in order to map uh, the outcome of the simulations onto a network where you can have both the individual organism, again, this represents Salmonella, this E. coli, and this is not really immediately obvious, but this represents in a way that is not really intelligible, but represents the whole metabolic network of Salmonella, and this represents the whole metabolic network of E. coli, um, and these are the metabolites that are being exchanged in red, are the metabolites that are used by both organisms. So these are um, sources of competition between the two organisms. And there is the oxygen, uh, nitrogen, uh, sulfur, and phosphorus sources. Uh, there are metabolites that are produced by both, uh, such as CO2. And then there are metabolites that are being exchanged in gray, such as the methionine and the acetate. And for example, here the model um, predicts that for some reason also galactose could be a uh, uh, an exchange metabolite, something that is a new uh, prediction of the model. But this is just to highlight, right, that in addition to representing the simulations as, as dynamical graphs showing the um, change of abundance of different species, one can start building ecological networks where you have both the species, uh, the microbial species, and the metabolites potentially getting insight into um, what aspects of the internal network are responsible for the exchange and um, utilization of the different resources in the environment. And in an early attempt, which is not really representative of what happens probably in, in a real gut microbiome, but we started doing simulations of um, uh, some key taxa from uh, gut microbial communities, including the famous or infamous Clostridium difficile. Um, and you can see that uh, there are a number of metabolites that are exchanged or that organs can compete, compete on. And again, I mean, this is just the tip of the iceberg of the kind of things that we and others are doing and can be done in the future to use these dynamical models to try and predict the structure of communities. Um, I will end by showing a couple of examples of how we're using comets for a number of other applications. Um, one is um, the use of communities for trying, uh, for the use of uh, flux balance modeling to try and predict what um, my environmental composition could give rise to a desired community structure. So you saw this from Alvaro's talk, and we talked about this um, uh, in the past, that somehow right, there is a lot of uh, interest in understanding how environmental composition affects microbial community um, um, structure. And the question Alan uh, Pacheco, here in the lab, asked recently is whether we can use this dynamic flux balance modeling to try and induce a desired composition by based on just the medium composition, based on the molecules that you feed to the community. So here, uh, what Alan did was, in, uh, was to use a genetic algorithm to try and design communities with a specific proportion of taxa. Let me illustrate how we use the genetic algorithm in this case. Uh, these are, these um, squares represent the different nutrients given to the community in dynamic flux balance com comets simulations. So based on the set of nutrients you give, it could be three, five, and so on, you get a certain dynamics for the community. Um, and you can rank or give scores or rank the, the um, communities based on how close they are to a desired uh, composition, to a desired structure. So for example, if you want all species to have equally abundant um, to be equally abundant at the end of the simulation, this would be a very good uh, simulation. So this means that this nutrient set is a very valuable one. This would also be quite good. So you can select those two um, and do mutations and recombination of these genomes that, uh, so to speak, that represent the nutrient composition of the media and obtain a new set of media, which can uh, then be fed to the algorithm again um, to uh, provide a new uh, round of the optimization process. So this is essentially just an optimization process uh, that is performed using a genetic algorithm based on the fitness calculations for the community uh, that are um, obtained with comets. And this is one, an, an example of the outcome of these simulations where um, you can ask, for example, for high abundance of one of the species, in this case, uh, out of three, uh, this is B. subtilis, if you ask for a high abundance of this species, uh, but uh, for survival and uh, you know, so that the other species do not disappear, uh, 
you'll get a certain uh, set of nutrients and a certain structure of the community that will uh, is predicted to uh, achieve this composition. And this will change, of course, if you change which the organisms that you prefer to be the most abundant. Um, so there is a, a, you know, a lot more than one could do and a lot more data that is um, in this bioarchive preprint, but I wanna um, quickly uh, soon switch to something else. I'll, I'll uh, conclude this part by just by saying that I think uh, one of the goals and one of the exciting part of using this dynamic flux balance modeling in comets is that one can start thinking of making predictions for uh, natural communities and engineered communities and try to see whether we can gradually reach the capacity to design communities with specific properties. And of course, this will require extensive experimental testing. We and others have started doing some of that. Um, and, um, and I think it will be exciting to see how this progresses. One thing I wanna highlight uh, to conclude this part is that, um, you know, in addition to the kind of mechanistic modeling that, that we discussed, right, where you try and predict the interaction networks in a community and the mechanism of interaction, the exchange of metabolites, starting from the genomes, there is a lot of data set that come from metagenomic sequencing um, and predictions of co-occurrence networks. And I think that one of the exciting endeavors in the future will be to try and understand more of the interplay between these two types of networks. And uh, it's clear that these co-occurrence networks do not necessarily mean uh, in actual interaction between these species. Um, but I think we are, it will be very useful and interesting to try and understand what is the connection between these two, because we'll be able to do more and more of this type of networks and there is already high abundance and there will be more of co-occurrence networks based on sequencing of uh, multiple communities. Let me pause here for a second before uh, we move to a very different topic. If there is any question. So there is a question from uh, Miguel Rodriguez. Yes. Please, uh, Daniel, uh, two, two very quick uh, questions. One is, uh, I saw you had in many of your uh, plots uh, either error bands or error bars, uh, even in the simulation. Is that derived from stochastic simulation or, or is it a, an actual measurement of error derived from the... Um, from the this was... Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think that the error bars I showed in the in the older models um, here. Yeah, I think these were based on uncertainty uh, in, in right. the parameters. At that time, we didn't do yet uh, stochastic simulations. So we could only vary the initial conditions or the parameters based on the uncertainty in the parameters. Uh, but now we do have we can uh, put stochasticity in the simulation so we can also generate error bars based on the stochasticity of the simulations themselves. Um, so I think, yeah, both are possible. And in, in early on, we didn't have stochasticity. Now this is part of the model, yes. If I, you have a second. Yeah, just a quick follow-up. There is a, one of the, one of those, your slides has a, a, a bunch of the of different organisms for which you model the potential interactions from the yes. gut, and it, it was it was clear. Yeah, this one. Uh, it's clear from here that E. coli has the richest metabolism of all. Uh, but obviously, that's probably just because we know more about E. coli than we know about the others. Is there a, is there a way to measure that the incompleteness? the effect of the incompleteness of a model into, into the simulation? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, and, and yes, I, I, I absolutely agree. I think the fact that we know much more like of E. coli is what causes this abundance of uh, different um, arrows. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, it's, uh, I'd have to think about this. I don't know that there is a clear individual metric that can tell you how, uh, how complete we expect the model to be. Um, there is certainly uh, from the gap filling algorithms, one can estimate, let's say how many kind of reactions were missing early on and how many have been added from the process of gap filling. So I could imagine that could give an idea 
of how much missing knowledge may be present in a given organism. But I haven't seen anyone, and we haven't done this. I think it's a very, you know, good idea, an interesting point that would be helpful to have, you know, some standardized metrics. I, I know there is actually a beautiful a, approach called MEMOTE. It's, it's a suit of uh, tools to analyze genome scale models uh, built by a, a large group of people. Um, I think that that may have some quantifications of this uncertainty, so it's uh, worth checking that. But uh, that's a very good question. I think it will be important to have metrics like this. Thank you. There is another question from Kisiok. Yes. Yes, it's a sort of an extension from Miguel's question. But if I want to use this Comet platform, do I need to get the growth rate of each species and the genome of species and have a great annotation. So we need three of those components. So um, you do not need the growth rate. You do need the annotated genome or an already built stoichiometric model. So I think um, I don't have it here, but if you um, look at some of the uh, slides from the first presentation or the second presentation, there are pointers. So there are a number of resources where you can download already built stoichiometric models. Um, so there are there is a database called Big B I G G that has a number of organisms that's from Bernard Paulson's website uh, or the group. There are uh, other groups that have their own models. There is a number of publications with already built FDA models and uh, resources like uh, KBase that can build automatically draft models from genomes and do gap filling. So there are a number of tools to generate these models from genomes. Once you have that information, in addition to the stoichiometry itself, in order to do the dynamic flux balance model, you do need the kinetic parameters for the uptake rates. Um, but actually, I should say that you know, in the simulation that I showed before, for example, we assumed uh, standard KM and KCAT for all metabolites based on the glucose, which is certainly not accurate, but it was good enough to give these predictions. Uh, maybe because uh, the main uh, carbon sources were still uh, sugars and organic acids. Um, but yes, in principle, you do need those parameters. They're not uh, very difficult to measure, much easier than intracellular parameters, but they're still necessary parameters for running dynamic flux balance analysis. You do not need the growth rate though. The growth rate is an outcome of the simulation. Um, and again, for these kinetic parameters, I think if you know nothing, you can assume um, kind of some uniform parameters uh, from the literature. Um, but the more you put in, of course, the more uh, accurate the predictions can be. So um, when I, if I want to create this natural community, like how many species would this model uh, take like is there like a limit or threshold of um, like yeah I think there it's I think the problem you know you can put in certainly tens or I think hundreds of models easily I think I don't know exactly actually what the largest number we tried but uh, I believe it's in the hundreds um, so I think the limitation is not so much you can imagine I mean the simulation is will grow linearly with the number of species because you'll have to go with each uh, model to do its own flux balance, but it doesn't grow more than linearly with the number of species. Uh, so I think the limiting factor for doing models of complex natural communities is actually the knowledge of the, you know, having good accurate stoichiometric reconstruction from the genomes, not the simulation engine itself. Um, oh, okay. And, and I should say, you know, we have tested the simulations on small communities. I, you know, whether or not and how accurate this will be on more complex communities is still um, unknown. And I think it's an interesting question that we and others are interested in addressing. Thank you so much. Yep, thank you. That's a very good question. Great, I don't see any more um, hand raised, so I think- Okay, so I'll, I'll move forward to just um, tell you a little bit um, on, you know, go to a, a slightly different approach, which is related to something we mentioned before, which is the ecosystem, whole ecosystem level approach to metabolism. And this um, somehow 
is something we applied to the study of the early evolution of metabolic networks. This is work done uh, with Josh Colford and Hyman Hartman, Temple Smith and Bobby Marslan. Um, and the idea, the starting point for this is, is somehow the following. So we tend to think of fossils as something that you see in rocks, right? You can see something like this. This is actually Edia current fossils, evidence of the, the first, uh, some of the first multicellular organisms. Um, uh, this is from Canada. And we can also, we got used to the idea that sequences, right? DNA sequences are also somehow fossils of early life. They contain information about the ancient history of life. Um, and the question one can ask is, why not networks, uh, right? Do metabolic networks, the same metabolic networks, or uh, they contain in their structure, in their architecture, information about the ancient history of metabolism and of life itself. And the question is, how can we tease out information about this? Um, and this is related again to this idea we uh, expressed early on that when you model a community, you can think of a community as a set of organisms, each of which has its own internal circuits and they could exchange things. And you can ask this question of whether you can predict uh, ecological interaction based on the intracellular circuit of this organism. But we also raised the question of whether perhaps at some point with maybe complex, if communities are complex enough and we know now uh, from Alvaro's lecture and uh, evidence in other contexts that like functions are, are so important in determining the, the, the fate of a community, perhaps it doesn't even matter which organism performs what function, we could treat the whole community of us as a soup of enzymes. Right, and, and look at the set of all the reactions as if they belong to a single compartment. Now, when you study ancient life, there is a very special meaning to this concept. And this meaning is related to horizontal gene transfer. And we know that um, microbes can exchange enzymes with each other um, and enzymes can uh, be transferred from one organism to another. So metabolic networks that at a given time seem to be uh, stable for and be associated with a given species. If you look at the long-term history of life, uh, you know, they, they can change and move from one organ to another. So you can, you can imagine this being a very plastic process where, where really um, uh, it's, it makes more sense to think of ecosystem level metabolism as a property of the whole ecosystem and not of individual organisms. So when you think this way, um, you can start asking these questions of not just what an organism can do with its, with its metabolism, but also what an ecosystem can do. What are the metabolic capabilities of an ecosystem? Except that now, uh, when you ask questions about the ancient history of life, you can make hypotheses, sorry, about um, what was possible in the presence of a few individual specific molecules that might have been present on early Earth. So you can ask questions about the expansion of this metabolism from an early uh, subset of metabolites. So it's as if you can try and get some historical uh, record of the growth of metabolism starting from its uh, an early seed of possible compounds. And the way we did this, um, we applied this, was by using an algorithm that has been developed, a beautiful, simple, but very powerful algorithm that was developed by Oliver Ebenhoff. Um, in Reiner Heinrich's group uh, several years ago. And this is um, called the network expansion algorithm. And the idea is, is the following. I'm gonna illustrate this on a very simple toy model of a network, but imagine this representing the huge network we saw before. So this is the network of all possible uh, metabolites as circles and reactions with the arrows. So imagine now you start with a seed of possible compounds for example, these two molecules are present. So you can ask simply, given that these two substrates are present, what possible new, what su new substrate could be possibly appearing in our world, given that these reactions are possible? And of course, uh, this reaction could in principle occur and uh, these two new metabolites could be added to this network. So you can define as the scope, the scope as the total set of metabolites that are being producible. This reaction cannot occur because you don't have this initial substrate, so the scope uh, that you obtain is the set of these four metabolites. Of course, if you are to add this initial molecule in the seed, then you can have these two, but also 
fire the second net uh, reaction and the whole network now becomes feasible. Now in, in uh, generating this network, we don't say anything about the presence of the enzymes that are needed to catalyze these reactions. Um, so we assume somehow that catalysts are present, enzymes or protoenzymes are present. If we look at the early history of life, we can get, we'll get back to this uh, later. Um, so I hope this is clear. Again, this is a very simple topological algorithm that allows you to uh, know what portions of a network can be reached based on an initial set of compounds. And now you can play the same game for the real network by taking some initial compounds and ask which of the you know, 10,000 or so metabolites present in the real network can be reached. Yes. Is there a question? I think it was not a question. Oh, uh, OK. <laughs> was, uh, please uh, raise any. Okay, go ahead, thanks. So, so um, one can ask what, what space of this network can be reached based on the initial uh, set of compounds. Um, and I'll show you first the way we applied this algorithm a few years ago in work done uh, with uh, Jason Raymond, asking a question related again to one of the things we uh, discussed early on in, in my first lecture, which is the transition from an anoxic to anoxic world. So if you remember about 2.2 billion years ago, um, uh, be, our atmosphere started becoming from anoxic, started to be filled with um, molecular oxygen. Uh, and this was due to the activity of bacteria. Now, oxygen can be very toxic, of course, and cause a lot of changes in metabolism. So we asked, based on this network, what could happen to metabolism if it's initially does not involve oxygen. And after a certain transition, it does involve oxygen. What changes would you expect could occur in metabolism because of the presence of oxygen? And there is a lot of aspects to this. So I'm just showing a snapshot of one of the outcomes of this analysis. In blue, you see the anoxic network. So this is, again, this is not a network of an individual organism, but it's the, again, the expanded network from an initial set of plausible early uh, earth metabolites into an expanded network um, that is involves reactions that are present in multiple different organisms. But I want to point out that what is striking is that there are these additional branches that become possible only when you add oxygen to the initial seed of the network. So when the network expands in presence of oxygen, there are all sort of new molecules that become available. And interestingly, there are very little changes at the core of the network. So even if we know that, of course, there is oxygen has a role as a um, electron acceptor for oxidative phosphorylation for this more efficient metabolism that we discussed. Um, but there are a lot of other roles that oxygen has, which are known, but they're kind of diffused through different pathways. And so you can, here you can see the impact of oxygen availability as a molecular substrate that enables the production of molecules that are some of these uh, more complex molecules, such as flavonoids, sterols, um, which includes cholesterol and a lot of molecules that are involved in um, uh, uh, communications, such as hormones, the terpenoid metabolism. So there are a lot of molecules that are, uh, in fact, um, uh, can be signatures of uh, eukaryotic and multicellular life that are really associated with the rise of oxygen in the atmosphere. Um, so this is an, uh, one possible utilization of this network. Uh, expansion algorithm, but I want to show you a more recent um, result, which was also obtained through the same algorithm, addressing um, what is known as the phosphate problem in origin of life research. So this is a mineral called apatite, uh, which contains phosphate. And, um, and this is a, an example of what could happen to a marine ecosystem where phosphate is uh, added in large amount, in this case, due to uh, um, pollution, um, and, and this causes a huge rise in the amount in the growth of uh, um, algae, um, photosynthetic bacteria. Now, what is interesting when uh, uh, about these rocks is that these are the kind of rocks where you expect phosphate to be found, um, except that it's very poorly bioavailable. So it can, it's, uh, it's, difficult to extract phosphate from these rocks. In fact, it can be extracted by bacteria through the secretion of uh, organic acids, but it's hard to imagine 
how phosphate could have been available uh, for early metabolic processes. And this is a problem because we know, as we saw again uh, the first time, there are molecules, central molecules for life such as coenzyme A and ATP that contain multiple phosphate atoms uh, in orange here. And there is plenty more. Um, in fact, one cannot really imagine a life without phosphate because DNA and RNA are phosphate containing molecules. So a life without phosphate would not have uh, nucleic acid, would be a life without genomes and without uh, transcription and translation and without this energy currency that uh, we discuss, ATP. So uh, we started asking this question though, whether it's possible that an early metabolism could have emerged prior to the availability of phosphate, and therefore whether it's possible that perhaps living systems could have emerged as an early metabolic process that could have later on given rise to life as we know it today with Darwinian selection based on genomes um, and uh, trans transcription translation. So we asked this question of whether, you know, if you start from a seed of metabolites that contain some carbon sources, sulfur, which is known to be present on early earth, and nitrogen, different sources of nitrogen. Um, so these are all carbon, carbon nitrogen, uh, sulfur, but there is no phosphate containing molecules. The question is, could you get any metabolism at all based on this um, phosphate free seed of metabolites? And our expectations when we uh, were to gonna run this uh, network expansion algorithm was that phosphate is so strongly embedded, it's present uh, every ATP that drives reactions contains phosphate. There is phosphate everywhere in metabolism today. So we thought it would be pretty much impossible to have anything but small pieces of this network. Uh, but we were very surprised to find that instead there is a core network um, that, is, that counts 315 reactions, 260 metabolites that is fully connected and that does not contain any phosphate at all. Uh, so uh, this is this uh, expanded network. It starts here. You can see CO2 and ammonia and some simple molecule. And as the uh, iterations of this network expansion algorithm progress, you add more and more molecules. Uh, it turns out that you can add, I believe 10 out of the 20 amino acids are part of this network and some of the precursors of nucleotides. And again, no phosphate at all, but there is this core network that is embedded in uh, present day metabolism that is again, not present necessarily in any individual organism, but an ecosystem, at an ecosystem level, this could be a snapshot of an early um, metabolism before phosphate become available. Um, I don't have time to go into all the details of this, um, but I wanna highlight, first of all, that this would be, uh, so, we don't really know, right? We're speculating about something that could have happened 3.8 billion years ago. And we, and nobody really have, has any idea of what exactly happened at those times. But what is inside, interesting about this kind of net, you know, this network we show is that this really exists. I mean, the network is there, whether or not it tells us something about ancient history, we're not sure, um, but it is potentially a fossil of this early metabolism. And one additional evidence uh, for this and that could provide some corroboration to this idea that this could be a fossil of early life is the fact that, so those reactions would have been catalyzed by simple uh, mineral surfaces and maybe small molecules, but there were no proteins at that time. Um, so how could we get some in insight into the possible catalysts at that time? And what uh, one can do is look at the enzyme that catalyzed those reactions today, those 350 reactions. And the protein itself is a very complex structure that could have not been present early on. But this, the cofactors, uh, some molecules that are in the active regions of this enzyme, some of these are very ancient molecules. For example, um, a lot of this enzyme contain this iron sulfur clusters that are um, minerals that are known to be associated with early earth environments. And we looked at how uh, frequently this iron sulfur clusters appear in this core network, in this network of um, phosphate independent metabolism versus the full expanded network. Um, and it turns out that there is a very strong enrichment of uh, this iron sulfur clusters in the, this core 
uh, network relative to the complete network, indicating that perhaps really uh, this network captures some of the early activity of metabolism on, on our planet. Um, there is follow-up work, which I'm not gonna have time to go into, exploring in a much more systematic way how different um, assumptions about the early Earth environment could uh, give rise to different uh, proto-metabolism. And this thing takes into account not just the carbon sources, nitrogen sources, and so on, but also what were the electron donors, where the electrons came from, uh, the pH and the temperature. And importantly, these come into play by uh, looking at the thermodynamic feasibility of this reaction. So in this network expansion that I just described, initially we did not take into account thermodynamics, but you can imagine that uh, in addition to the topological feasibility of this network, you wanna look at the thermodynamic feasibility, and this will depend on pH and temperature in a way that is, uh, can be estimated based on the um, energy formation of each of these compounds. Um, so we did these calculations and one can find again, um, uh, which networks can expand to the full, uh, to a large networks and which conditions do not give rise to expanded network, uh, finding more uh, parameters that seem to be conducive to uh, initial uh, metabolic network. Um, and I will conclude just by saying that what we started doing, which I think is also you know, a seed of something that could be done more in the future, we started applying this flux balance model to protocell models, uh, to protocell systems. So we took these networks that were obtained from this network expansion algorithm, and we tried to model them with the same tool that we use now to study um, present day cells. And one can look at whether these protocells could sustainably produce a simple biomass um, composed in this case, just of much simpler molecules than the biomass of organisms today, um, such as simple lipids, and um, keto acids that could be precursors of present day uh, proteins. So I will stop here and just acknowledge my group and thank all of you um, for listening from uh, all over the world. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks a lot, Daniel, for these uh, three fantastic lectures. So we have uh, time for a few questions. So. Uh, if anyone uh, wants to ask, please uh, use the raise and uh, uh, feature or type it in the chat. I don't see any question, any hand raised. I have a question myself. So, uh, regarding the the uh, the result on the um, uh, network scoping and uh, uh, sort of rec uh, reconstructing this primordial metabolism, uh, and perhaps I missed that. But is there? I mean, somehow you you see that there is this backbone, and uh, you see that, but. What is the null? Uh, and you are sort of using that to infer something that, as you say, that then 3.2 billion years ago, and there is some somewhat uh, a growing process on top of this network, right? So, is there a, a null model you can compare this this result to? So, uh, is this uh, something um, somehow you couldn't expect by chance to happen by chance, uh, in some sense? That's a, that's a great question. I think um, there is, so you can, you can like one, one example of this would be, you know, we, which I didn't go into in details, but these are all the different conditions. So you can add or remove different molecules and ask what happened if you didn't have this compound or this other compound. And you can see that um, many initial conditions do not result in an expanded network. So it's not an obvious case that all possible conditions will lead to an expanded network. You need certain conditions to occur. And when you add the thermodynamics, you can see that also you have ranges of temperature and uh, free energy and so on that, that give and do not give rise to, um, to this network. But I think what you're pointing out is, is a broader question, which is, 
this is based on the chemistry we know today, right? And, and how do we know that we're not biased towards just, you know, this is based on all the reactions that are known to be present in metabolism today, but there may have been other chemistries that, you know, appear, that these appear throughout the history of life. Um, and, you know, one, what could argue about this? One, one thing that I think is very helpful is to do exercises, going back to what I introduced at the very beginning, this artificial chemistries. And that, that can give um, opportunities to, to ask, uh, generate null hypotheses with arbitrarily uh, complex chemistries to ask um, how likely it is to obtain an expanded network based on uh, different assumptions on the nature of the chemistry and the amount of reactions that were um, lost throughout this process. I'm not sure this addresses your question. I think it's a, it's a hard question to ask. Right? What is a null hypothesis when you talk about uh, these early metabolic processes? Yeah, I, yes. I mean, I guess it's uh, why all the question about the origins of life and uh, hard to answer. Yes. So there is uh, another question from Matteo who is asking whether uh, you see a connection between uh, uh, your work, his work, and uh, recent theoretical advances in uh, uh, stochastic thermodynamics of biochemical networks? Um, I, I, yes, I mean, the short answer is yes. I think there is a lot of interesting connections. Um, I think that, right, the way this flux balance model started early on, there was no thermodynamics. Um, but I think that uh, adding the thermodynamics opens up a lot of new possibilities. In particular, um, yeah, one can look at um, the, uh, you know, not all this uh, metabolic flux states that are feasible based on FPA um, are necessarily feasible thermodynamically. And the classical example is you can have, uh, you know, three reactions running in a circle that is uh, balanced in terms of uh, fluxes, but of course it's infeasible thermodynamically. Um, and there's been a number of studies trying to add thermodynamic constraints to flux balance modeling. And, and I think, you know, the works you're mentioning are, I think are somehow complementary to that literature, but I think there is a lot more work to be done in bringing these two pieces together. Um, I think there are also interesting questions of whether, um, you know, one can revise the objective functions based on thermodynamic principles. Uh, so I, you know, I think it's, it's an open area, but I definitely think there is, there are connections. And I think a lot of these are still yet to be explored. Great. So I don't see uh, any other questions. So let me thank again uh, Daniel for these uh, three um, great lectures.